everybody. I'm Helena Carbon. I'm the president of Just World Educational, a small educational nonprofit located in Washington, D.C., in the traditional lands of the Piscataways. Today is June 11th, 2022. Our webinar today is part of a project we're running throughout June to educate new generations of Americans about the horrors of nuclear war and what we need to do as a society to step aside from these terrible risks once and for all. Our project is called The Urgency of Banning Nukes. The crisis in Ukraine has served as a worrying wake-up call about the reality of what my friend and colleague Richard Falk has called the situation of nuclear apartheid in which the peoples of the whole world find ourselves. However, we also have some good news to talk about in our project because at the level of global politics, we now, since January of last year, have a worldwide treaty in place called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW. Sadly, none of the states that actually have nuclear weapons today have yet signed it. And the two biggest and scariest nuclear arsenals in the world today by far are those controlled by the United States and Russia. This weekend marks the 40th anniversary of the truly massive demonstrations seen in New York City and many other US cities calling for a complete ban on nuclear weapons. Those demonstrations had some real impact on our leaders. But after the Cold War became defused and the United States seemed to emerge as an unrivaled global power, many of us kind of forgot about the whole issue of nuclear weapons and we all failed to educate the coming generations sufficiently about nuclear dangers. I see our current job as anti-war Americans being to build a movement that's strong enough to push our government to sign on to this very important treaty, the TPNW, which was spearheaded by the nations of the global south. It is very sobering to remember that if nuclear annihilation happens, then it will be a much speedier form of annihilation than anything that climate change can cause. But first, we need to understand the issues around nuclear war, nuclear deterrence, and nuclear risk very well. And that is what this project on the urgency of banning nukes is all about. Please check out our website, www.justworldeducational.org to learn more about the project, which will also include more webinars coming ahead every Wednesday and Saturday for the next few weeks and tell your friends and networks about them. We have as our fabulous guest and resource person here today, Vicki Elson, who is the co-founder and creative director of nuclearban.us, which is the US affiliate of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN. Also behind the scenes today is my colleague, Amel Zarug, she would have been up on the screen, but she's had a bad flying experience recently. So she's behind the scenes and she will do a much better job at Zoom teching there than I did when I was on, on the roll on Wednesday. Anyway, I hope we have good time for Q&A after I have first interrogated Vicky a bit about what nuclearban.us has been doing. So Vicky is, okay, here, now I'll go to her. her bit more about her bio. She believes that there's only one way to be truly safe from the danger of nuclear weapons, nuclear accidents, attacks, and war. And that is to eliminate every single nuclear weapon from the face of the earth forever, preferably before they eliminate us. Vicki lives in Washington, DC, because she believes that the US is a very important place to be working on disarmament. And believe it or not, there's some good progress happening in Congress that she'll tell you about. In other good news, we have excellent tools to achieve total global nuclear disarmament, including the Nobel Peace Prize winning treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. But we need to act now before it's too late. Today, we'll talk about how we can use the TPNW to solve the nuclear weapons problem once and for all. So Vicki, tell us, how did you get involved in this? Well, I was just a, um, a, a grandma and I was kind of vaguely 
<clears throat> aware that nuclear weapons are the mother of all climate wreckers, geno genocidal weapons, injustices, catastrophes for which there's no meaningful medical response, expressions of unearned supremacy, thefts of money better spent on climate solutions, food, shelter, education, healthcare. So I kind of had that in the back of my mind and I was worried about it, trying not to worry about it too much. And then I went on a date. It was my fourth date with a new friend and he took me to the United Nations. And it happened to be the day that 122 countries agreed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So I actually got to be in the room for paragraph 17, articles two and three. And then uh, when the thing was actually agreed, I was in the, um, I was in the UN cafe and you know, texting back and forth with my new friend, Tim, because uh, he didn't have a, they, they ran out of those earpieces that translate. So I was kind of helping him translate. So we were kind of doing that together. Um, so the extraordinary thing about these uh, negotiations is that Elaine White Gomez, who's the ambassador from Costa Rica, ran a really tight ship. She didn't just let people go on and give speeches endlessly as with most of these kind of things. She made people do the work and they did the work and they came up with this, uh, this beautiful document. So um, what really moved me was the moment that the treaty was agreed and later we'll show you a film of that actual moment when the vote happened. Um, everybody in the, in the room broke all the rules of the UN. They're supposed to be, you know, very, have a lot of decorum and, you know, sit still and all that sort of thing. And they all jumped out of their seats and they were, you know, just ecstatic. And there were people in the room who had survived Hiroshima and Nagasaki when they were children. And they're now quite elderly. And they were there having worked on this for 72 years, making sure it never happens again, what happened to them. And it was just, it was, it was so exciting. Like, oh, we can do something about this, um, you know, that's new, that's something we've never done before. And, um, and it's really, really promising. So, um, you know, I'm really grateful to all the people who worked on this for many, many decades. And I'm really excited to be joining that crowd as we uh, as we move forward with with a new um, and, and very promising tool. Um, so the TPNW makes everything to do with nuclear weapons illegal under international law in the ratifying countries, everything, you know, not just using them, threatening to use them, having them, storing them, moving them around, financing them. Hopefully uh, countries will will um, take that very seriously as well. Um, so it puts a lot of pressure on the nuclear weapons companies, the two dozen companies in the world that, that are complicit in this industry. And then a really exciting thing happened in October of that year, the International Campaign for the Treaty of Nuclear Weapons, uh, uh, for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And, um, and then also very exciting, this month, in fact, in 10 days, the 61 ratifying countries and their supporters and their, uh, the NGOs that support them and uh, observer countries, they're all getting together in Vienna and they're going to be um, you know, working out the details of how to enforce the treaty. So this is really, really exciting. And my, I married the guy, by the way, that took me on that great date. His <laughs> name is Tim and Wallace. And he will be in Vienna at the treaty and we're going to be having a press conference here with members of Congress who have signed on to support the treaty. And that'll be broadcast to Vienna. And um, that's, that's very, very exciting. So the world knows that 100 nuclear weapons exchanged, like between India and Pakistan, say, that would be kind of a moderate nuclear war, you know, that that could kick enough soot into the atmosphere to disrupt the climate, disrupt agriculture, and starve 2 billion human beings, just a little you know, small nuclear war. The world knows that the US dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan in 1945, which slaughtered hundreds of thousands of non-white civilians. And now they're much bigger. One nuclear submarine off the coast of, for example, Korea right now carries weapons more than a thousand times more destructive than Hiroshima. Um, you've heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The world has come within minutes of a nuclear holocaust a dozen times beside that that we know of. Um, and also that we know of, there have been like a thousand documented accidents involving nuclear weapons that could have led to detonation, but luckily didn't. 
And one thing people don't seem to realize right now is that even so-called tactical nuclear weapons are not little, they just don't go very far. Um, they're Hiroshima size. So um, of all the countries in the world, two thirds of them supported this treaty negotiation happening and including, this is really fun, early on North Korea, the only nuclear weapons country to express support for the treaty was North Korea early on in the process. Um, 135 took part in the negotiations, 122, excuse me, 124 took part in the negotiations, 122 adopted the treaty in July 2017, 86 have signed it, and as of just very recently, 61 have ratified it. Um, so the idea is to force the nuclear weapon states, those nine countries that are holding the rest of the world hostage, to bow to global pressure and also legislative risk. Um, you know, they, they are violating international law. Um, meanwhile, it also, uh, we, we want to force the companies to bow to economic and reputational risk and pressure and convert to green technologies and things that we really need to survive. Um, and we need to educate and inspire the public to help with all that, which is what Just World Educational is all about. Thank you. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a little look at a video that will tell you a little bit more about the treaty. This is the moment that changed everything. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has been put to a vote. Since World War II, we still haven't been able to get rid of nuclear weapons. Uh, so far, we've got 122 nations voting in favour. I really care about all human lives. You know, I think everyone's value, um, you know, is equal. And I think that a lot of people have been harmed by nuclear weapons. Their indiscriminate nature means that if one is used, civilians will die in the millions and millions. Um, and I find that unacceptable. I think that should be illegal. And I think that should always have been illegal. The voting has been completed. The machine is locked. The U.S. invests the billion, billions of dollars in developing nuclear weapons. Can you imagine that? This money can help poor community to stand. I think it would be a good idea to actually take all this trillions of money to actually build that nuclear bomb, to actually like do something for the global warming that is actually affecting people. I think that all nations, all people, all young people, black people, they have to stand against nuclear weapons. This is the moment that the United Nations voted to start their nuclear weapons for all time. <laughs> The treaty prohibits everything to do with nuclear weapons, including making them, using them, threatening to use them, and even financing them. In recognition of their work on the Nuclear Ban Treaty, the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Represented by ICANN Director Beatrice Finn of Sweden and Setsuko Thurlow, who survived the U.S. bombing of Hiroshima in 1945 when she was 13 years old. She has campaigned all her life for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. The world is speaking with one voice. Nuclear weapons are unacceptable, like chemical and biological weapons. The nine nuclear armed nations must sign the nuclear ban treaty and negotiate together a multilateral plan to dismantle every single one. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We have about 10 years to profoundly curb greenhouse gas emissions if we are to survive as a species, as a planet. And in the United States alone, we're spending about $10 million per hour on nuclear weapons of mass extinction. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. 
and if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. A new report demonstrates how this can be achieved. By fortunate coincidence, the jobs, scientific talent, and facilities can shift rather neatly from an industry of death to an industry of life. How do we use the elimination of one great existential threat to humanity to solve the other great existential threat? This is the moment. The world is waking up to the climate emergency because we can see it happening. And the world has come together with a new treaty that makes global nuclear disarmament possible at last. We must shift our priorities right now. And we can. It's a big investment, but the benefits are as large as life itself. Yeah, a treaty. We all have fresh hope. Vicki, thank you so much for that beautiful film that you made. Um, you know, I think just before we um, get into the next question that I have for you, I'm going to run a poll here and I'm going to run poll number four, which is, um, is which comes closest to your views. And this will be, okay, this is for everybody who's attending here, which comes closest to your views on nuclear weapons? A, I try not to think about it, hope the war doesn't happen. B, reduce the number of nuclear weapons, but keep some nukes to keep other countries from nuking us. C, we need total global nu nuclear abolition to survive. So we've had four people, we've had, oh, we've got strong support for option C. My goodness, here it comes, here it comes, okay. I'll give everybody just another three seconds, two seconds, and now I'm going to end the poll. And okay, everybody, we got 100% support for option C there. We need total global nuclear abolition to survive. So thank you, everybody, for running in our poll there. Okay, now I have. Um, Another question for you, Vicki. I hear you have some good news for us. Well, yes, in addition to the treaty and the meeting of states parties, which is coming up in 10 days, um, there are a lot of people, including large financial institutions around the world, divesting from the nuclear weapons industry. And uh, I don't know if you've heard, but New York City has decided to divest its pension funds from the nuclear weapons industry. That's huge. Um, I found that being able to hold up the treaty was really helpful recently when I was in a, a meeting at, it was a shareholders meeting at Northrop Grumman, the second biggest <laughs> military uh, company in the world. And I, I bought a share of stock. I went to their shareholders meeting and I stood up in front of all the big wigs and I said, you know, your product is illegal under international law in these ratifying countries. And you're gonna need to convert if you wanna keep your jobs and your profits and." you know, all that stuff going. And then I actually, after the meeting, I had a chance to go talk to the CEO of Northrop Grumman and I put a copy of the treaty into her hands and that felt just kind of special. Um, so I, I feel like having the treaty gives us so much more clout, uh, you know, when we, when we go to talk to politicians or to companies or to the press. Um, the press, by the way, is really not doing a great job covering this and, and we, need, we need to really pressure them to do a lot more. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, in nuclear ban, what we're doing is we're working on members of Congress to sign the ICANN pledge to support the treaty or to support a bill that uh, Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton has put out saying, yep, sign and ratify the treaty, convert all those wasted resources to green technologies and other pressing human needs. It's a wonderful piece of legislation. If it were to pass, we could all have quite a party. Um, so we have asked, um, members of Congress to do this. And so far, 17 of them have done one or the other or both, including the entire squad, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, Representative Jim McGovern will be running the press conference that we're having during the meeting of states parties. 
Um, you can see a whole list if you, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a link later on to look at that. Um, so that's 17 members of Congress that we need hundreds more. Um, you know, that alone is not going to do it, but it's 17 more than we were told we would get. So, um, you know, there's a bit of momentum there and we need everybody on board to, to build that because it's probably the most important uh, decision-making power on this. So um, there is a campaign coming up to get the word out um, to the press and I'll, we'll have a link to that later on. And also other good news is that the Poor People's Campaign is coming to Washington DC next weekend and uh, Code Pink here in DC is hosting them. And there is a whole anti-militarism part of that collaboration that I'm really excited to be part of here in DC. Um, you know, we really have to work intersectionally. It's not just climate, it's not just justice, it's not just, you know, all the many, many issues that we have to repair. Um, they all fit together and uh, we all really need to work together. So actually you mentioned how, you know, the intersectionality, how these issues go together. And I just want to come back to Richard Falk's um, comment about the situation of nuclear apartheid and what he means by that and what we all mean by that is that as it happens, the five, what are called the five recognized nuclear weapon states also happen to be the five states that have vetoes and permanent membership on the Security Council. So that's, you know, that means that every country that doesn't have nuclear weapons is subject to that UN veto. It, they have far less political rights in today's world than these big five that have the veto, they have nuclear weapons, and they have permanent membership. So that's the nuclear apartheid that we want to dismantle, need to dismantle. Um, you've talked a little bit about what makes the uh, TPNW a game changer, Vicky. Um, can you explain how it changes the conversation about nuclear weapons? Yeah, well, this treaty is really special in that it didn't come from the nine nuclear weapons countries. They've had a treaty on the table for more than 50 years that hasn't fixed the problem. In fact, there were only nine country, uh, five countries when it started, and now there are nine. It just, it's, just, it's only gotten worse, the non-proliferation treaty. So this treaty didn't come from the nine nuclear weapon states. It came from the rest of the world saying we have had enough. And um, it outlaws, you know, as I said, everything to do with nuclear weapons, including financing them. It includes victim assistance and environmental remediation. Um, the process began not with politics, but with the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. And the Hibakusha, the, the people who survived the nuclear bombings in Japan, and, um, and other people who have survived nuclear testing and mining. And, um, you know, there has, you know, mostly indigenous people have really suffered in that way. Um, those people also played a really important role. So it validates total abolition as what the world dem demands and can achieve. It stigmatizes nuclear weapons, strongly reinforces a, an international norm that treats nuclear weapons as utterly unacceptable in the civilized world. And since it does establish a norm, you know, the US own law of war manual says if there's an international law, we have to abide by it. So, you know, I hope that they're paying attention. Um, as I said, you know, when I went to Northrop Grumman, it gives you a lot of clout to be able to, to have the treaty. Um, you know, they're in the same category as chemical and biological weapons. And that is a powerful thing to be able to say. Um, and it sets a really high bar beyond non-proliferation, beyond arms control, beyond measures that reduce the danger but don't eliminate it. Um, it, it sets a really high bar. And um, personally, that's where I want to put my energy. That's great. Um, I have to say that I think that nuclear weapons are orders of magnitude more dangerous than chemical and biological weapons. And that a lot of the discourse in this country whereby the whole thing gets kind of recategorized as weapons of mass destruction and then you know justifies the invasion of Iraq, although they didn't have any. I, I mean, I, I think it's important to single out nuclear weapons for particular attention and particular approbation and particular abolition. So tell us about the meeting of states parties that's coming up just in 10 days, you said. 
Yes. Um, well, as I said, there are 61 ratifying countries plus observers and supporters and uh, UN agencies and the International Committee for the Red Cross and the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement. Um, ICANN has 364 organizations in 107 countries and Nuclear Ban is just one of those. Is Just World also an ICANN partner? I don't know how to do it, so maybe you could tell me. <laughs> You've got it. Okay, well, that's easy. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of those organizations will be there too. The states' parties are going to discuss how to enforce it in each nation. Um, we're hoping that they go for really tough enforcement measures. Um, Ireland has already done that. They have said that if you are breaking this treaty uh, in Ireland, you can go to jail for the rest of your life, including if you're an executive of a, of a corporation that's guilty of this. Um, you can also face heavy fines. And then Cuba did something interesting. When they signed the treaty, they put in a, a clause about forbidding financing of nuclear weapons. And that's also really, really important to making this work. So we're hoping that they really go for it. Um, they'll also be talking about how to get more people on board, more countries signing and ratifying the treaty, um, reparations, remediation, and, and details like, like deadlines. Um, what else are they doing? That's it. Uh, that's all I can think of right now. But um, there are other meetings happening as well during the week about the humanitarian consequences and um, all kinds of exciting things. It's going to be an amazing time in Vienna. Well, that's great. I'm so glad that uh, Tim Wallace is going to be able to go there. Um, maybe he could give us a telephone call and give us a live update. We have a couple of other people that we're hoping to get live updates from. So tell us something that's been on the mind of several people I've talked to recently. What would happen if the United States gave up its nukes? Ah, I hear that question every day. Um, people say, you know, if the U.S. were to give up its nukes, wouldn't we be sitting ducks? for somebody to take us over, somebody to nuke us. And the answer is, you know, the, the treaty calls for all nations to give up their nuclear weapons. Nobody's expecting just the US to give up its nuclear weapons while Russia, China, North Korea hang on to theirs. But if the United States did magically, unilaterally decide to get rid of its nuclear weapons, probably nothing bad would happen. Other countries might follow suit. Some of them have nuclear weapons to defend themselves from us. And they're very expensive and they're really hazardous to have lying around. So, you know, it might really kickstart the process. Um, so despite what we've been taught all our lives, threatening to retaliate with nuclear weapons does not actually protect us from anybody um, doing anything. It never has and it never will. An eye for an eye, as Gandhi said, makes the whole world blind, or in this case, makes the whole world dead. Um, as you were alluding, you know, these are not weapons of mass destruction. These are weapons of mass extinction, potentially. Um, so you can see now how Russia is using the threat of nuclear weapons to prevent other countries from interfering with its illegal invasion of another country. And the U.S. did the exact same thing in Iraq. So the TPNW, of course, makes threatening also illegal. Um, nuclear weapons countries get invaded and lose wars all the time. The, uh, it's happened to France, Israel, the UK, India, and the US. It didn't prevent 9-11 that we had nuclear weapons. It didn't help us win in Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan. So a nation that gives up its nuclear weapons um, does not become any more vulnerable than it already was. And, and we have accidentally you know, had very near misses on our own soil with our own weapons, you know, just in our own backyard. Um, meanwhile, just FYI, the US has the biggest conventional military on the planet um, by a long shot. So I think we're coming up to um, talking about Ukraine and nuclear weapons, which is actually pretty interesting. So I'm going to run the first poll that you had. Thank you so much for creating these polls. Um, how do I? OK, poll one. Darn it. OK, poll one. How do I run it? Says the poll has ended. You know, I think because I ran poll five first. Why don't you carry on talking? You tell us about Ukraine and nuclear weapons, and I will um, recreate these other polls. If you can tell okay. us about Ukraine and nuclear weapons. Okay. Well, there's a there's a man named Earl Turcott. He's the former Canadian disarmament negotiator, and he calls the current crisis in Ukraine a planet-wide near-death experience. 
And he says, we should use this opportunity, this moment of increased awareness to demand the total elimination of nuclear weapons as quickly as humanly possible, end quote. So Ukraine may have one silver lining, perhaps. We're aware of the reality more, you know, more of us are aware that we live with this reality every single day, only now it's just a little bit scarier. And it will keep repeating over and over with different countries, different disagreements, different troubles um, until we get rid of nuclear weapons altogether. So nuclear weapons can cause burns, collapsing infrastructure, climate disruption, agricultural failure, poisoned air, water and food, cancers, eyeballs falling out, skin falling off, babies born with no bones, whole cities or countries to disappear, even the end of life on earth. Um, they're pretty much as dangerous for the nuke-er as for the nuke-e. Other than that, they're nice. Um, so a bit of history. The Manhattan Project scientists in the 1940s, uh, when they invented these things, they were concerned that a nuclear explosion could set the Earth's entire atmosphere on fire, but they talked themselves out of it. That same kind of reckless attitude still prevails today. Um, so um, also, you know, people are, are saying, well, we need nuclear weapons because they, uh, they ended World War II. And in fact, most historians now are not so sure about that. Um, they say the war was about to end for other reasons. And interestingly, as we can see in Ukraine right now, when you bomb cities, it doesn't end the war. It doesn't make people surrender. It makes them fight even harder. So um, how are you doing with that poll? OK, I think I can run this poll. I'm sorry, I've, it's a long time since I've done polls. Um, OK, poll this one, OK. Great, here it goes. Okay. So the question is, which one is closest to your own response to the Ukraine crisis? A, we call it the mo more war. Throw money and weapons at the Ukraine crisis despite the nuclear risk. Option B is less war. Let's have ceasefires, de-escalation and negotiation. And option C is called holy <clears throat> nukes are still a thing. So, um, oh, we've got some interesting uh, answers coming in here. And I'm going to run it for another five seconds, four, three, two, one, and OK. So we have 83% of people are saying their own response to the Ukraine crisis is less war ceasefires, de-escalation, and negotiation. So that is great. And 17% saying, holy crap, nukes are still a thing, which I think I, I'm surprised that that's not a, a more um, common response. But anyway, there we are. Thanks for creating that poll. <laughs> so did you know? that there are 50 nuclear weapons at the bottom of the sea. They sank with ships or submarines, they crashed with airplanes, they rolled off ships, um, and they're still there. They're too soggy to detonate, but sooner or later that radioactive material is gonna leak out. So I just thought you might like to um, be bummed out by that too. <laughs> so, uh, hang on, okay, I've, I've lost my, my script here. As people may know, I have this vision problem, which leaves me, I mean, I, I know a lot of people live with one eye or indeed with no vision whatsoever, but I'm still trying to get used to it. So- um, Doing great. Okay. Well, thanks for the news about the nuclear weapons at the bottom of the sea and everything else. Um, I have a lot of friends who really don't want to think about nuclear weapons because they say it gets them really depressed. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we cheer ourselves up apart from listening to Tom Lehrer? <laughs> Good old Tom Lehrer. Um, well, if you're afraid of nuclear weapons, that is not an irrational fear. Um, if you don't like to think about them, I don't blame you. I don't like to think about them either. The way I deal with this reality is getting together with smart change makers and finding out what I can do about it, and then just doing my best. Um, we do have some reasons to celebrate right now and to be hopeful. So here's, here's what you do when you're bumming out, uh, a, a suggestion, okay. Acknowledge the fears 
and the feelings that you're struggling with, despair, hopelessness, anger, whatever they are. Um, and then realize that you're not alone. You know, a lot of us are having those feelings right now, including probably a lot of people you're close with. Actually, just by being on this webinar, I already know that you care and that you want to make a difference. So thank you for being here. Um, you have other strengths too. You are maybe resilient, compassionate, skillful. You're a good communicator. So, you know, think about what your, your strengths are. And then use your strengths, do stuff, do it in community. Um, and that will probably help most days. So Vicky, you had created um, a number of other polls about the Ukraine crisis. Should we run the other polls or should we go to yeah, the okay. last poll, which I really like? Okay. Um, so the last poll um, is... How committed are you to solving this problem? And the possible answers, you can only answer one, are A, I've got a full plate, so I'll send thoughts and prayers. There are no wrong answers. No wrong answers, thank you. And thoughts and prayers, I mean, prayers could help. <laughs> B, I'm busy, but it's worth it to spend a few minutes per week. C, I'm working on other issues, but I see the intersections and I'll include nuclear weapons in my work. And D, whatever I'm busy with won't happen if we don't exist. So I'll put in some serious time. So, okay, this, these are interesting poll results. Um, by the way, nobody so far is sending thoughts and prayers. So I guess we'll have to just create our own thoughts and prayers while we do stuff. Is, is that how it works? Okay, so I'll give it five more seconds. Four, don't you like me doing countdowns like this? Three, two, one, and I'm gonna end the poll. So interesting results. We got 50% of the people saying whatever I'm busy with won't happen if we don't exist. So I'll put in serious time. Yay! We've got 33% of the people saying I'm working on other issues, but I see the intersections and I'll include it in my work. That is super. And 17% saying I'm busy, but it's worth it to spend a few minutes per week. So thank you people for your responses to the poll. That's great. So um, here's a really tough question for you, Vicky. Mm. It's been 77 years since Hiro the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I have to say I have been to Hiroshima and it was really an important experience for me. Um, so I'm sure it has been for many other people as well, but it's been 77 years. Why do we still have these things, these nuclear weapons? Well, it's a, it's a tough question, but an easy answer. Uh, the answer is that uh, there is um, money at the center of the problem, like with everything else, just follow the money. So, uh, you know, nuclear weapons can cause all kinds of harm. They also cause a small number of people to become very, very wealthy, as with the fossil fuels industry, as Greta Thunberg said in the, in the video. So there are these two dozen corporations and they have a lot of money and they use it to influence politicians by lobbying, by uh, having think tanks, by having a revolving door between jobs in the industry and jobs in the government. Um, and then the, you know, the government votes to fund them. And then all of them try to convince us that nuclear weapons somehow keep us safe. Um, that's it. That's the whole answer. There's, there's a theory of deterrence, you know, that they, that we have to have these things to keep us safe. And it's like the world's biggest game of chicken. You know, I don't really like it. Um, it doesn't make me feel very safe right now. I don't know what Putin might do. I don't know what Kim Jong-un or some disgruntled guys on a submarine might do. Um, I, in the last administration, I had no idea what the president might do from one second to the next. Um, so I have been um, quite anxious about this. Um, that's why the world came up with the TPNW. They've had enough. That's a, a great answer. Yeah, so that's, I mean, who is gonna, who is gonna persuade these nine national 
governments that they need to preferably, you know, through agreement amongst themselves, but they, that they need to get rid of these things. Um, well, the corporations are pulling the political strings um, and we're using the, the TPNW to shame and stigmatize the companies and get people and institutions to divest. Um, we're hoping that the corporations will then ask the government to help them convert to more sustainable technologies. Um, and uh, in order to pressure the politicians and the profiteers, again, it's all about educating the public and getting people to participate. So how do we do that? What can regular people do? Ah, so many things. Okay, if you can publish social media, TikToks, letters to the editor, art, music, poetry, banners, you have power. If you can write um, to politicians, to profiteering CEOs, you have power. If you can get your friends together, preferably with food, you <laughs> have power. Okay, if you like flyering, stickering, tabling, making videos, getting things published, public speaking, organizing groups or events, you have power. If you do nonviolent direct action or you like, to, um, you like to do that at government or military or corporate facilities, you have power. If you're a teacher, you have power. If your institution or college or bank has nuclear weapons investments, you have power. If you're in a STEM field, you have power. You can choose not to work in this industry and be very public about that choice. If you vote, you have a superpower. I know it might not seem like it sometimes, but please, please vote every chance you get in every election at every level of government. If you know how to contact your state, federal, and local legislators in writing or on the phone or in person, then you have a super, super power. Okay, they really like to only listen to their own constituents. So a lot of what we're doing is coordinating people in various constituencies, various districts to talk to their own leaders and put the pressure on them that way. Constituent power is a super, super power. So you gave us a lot of ideas. What's the most urgent right now? Ah, well, I happen to have a slide for that. <laughs> Here are three easy, powerful actions you can take this month. Okay, Monday, this coming Monday, uh, the Nuclear Ban Treaty Collective, of which uh, we are a part, that's many organizations across the country, um, they're having people write coordinated letters to the editor at three major media outlets saying, hey, you're not covering the treaty enough, you're not covering abolition enough, here's what's happening, this is important global news happening in Vienna right now, you know, please cover it. So you can go to that meeting. And the links for everything are in the chat, by the way, the links to the videos and resources, and they all should be in the chat. Um, if you live in Massachusetts, or if you know anybody who lives in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. um, we are working on a state bill there to set up a nuclear ban commission, um, or just a, a commission to explore the relationship of nuclear weapons to the state of Massachusetts. So looking at um, you know, what is the danger? Is Massachusetts a target? What about all the companies that make their money on nuclear weapons? How can they convert? You know, so, um, you know, believe it or not, it's not, it's not like get rid of any, every nuclear weapon today, but it's the best we've been able to get through and it's gotten its way out of committee and it's on a roll. We need people to get the entire Massachusetts legislature behind it. So that's a good one. Um, and that's time limited. That's, that's kind of right now too. Um, and then asking your federal Congress people uh, to sign the ICANN pledge to support the treaty or to co-sponsor the Norton Bill, which is currently called HR 2850, to convert the wasted resources to green products, um, or to do either one or both of those things. Uh, again, if they hear from their constituents and uh, you know, maybe you know people in other districts uh, across the country, that can really, really help too. So those are, those are current actions. And then there's one action on the next slide that kind of doesn't expire. And that is to um, just go to nuclearband.us and sign up for updates, news, resources, action alerts. Um, do you see that there? Not quite, uh, I'm sure it's coming. Um, 
So those are the most uh, the most juicy things I could think of. Oh, there we are. There we go. Great. So for tools to do any of this stuff, um, you know, keep in touch with us. And um, you know, we we really need to build the team across organizations in our organization, across countries, across continents. You know, jump in. You have the power. Um, and of course, you can always donate to any of these organizations that you see in the chat, and including uh, very much uh, Just World Educational. And Helena will tell you about that in a little bit. But meanwhile, let's have a nice, uh, nice little video to kind of wrap things up here. And then we'll have a question and answer. Vicky, thank you, Amel, behind the scenes. So if anybody has um, a question, please raise your hand now. Um, otherwise, I have a couple of questions. I want to come in um, back to Vicky. Um, Vicky, how about arms control and non-proliferation? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, I believe that uh, to survive as a species, of course, we have to get rid of all nuclear weapons, we have to go way beyond those things. Um, those are all great measures, arms control, reducing the number and non-proliferation, which means not, not letting it spread to other countries, um, or getting rid of one missile system or another. I mean, that's all fine, but it's just not gonna be enough. Um, and I don't think that total abolition is any less realistic a thing to work on than anything else. And in fact, I think that total abolition is gonna get a lot more people excited than measures that are on the way uh, to abolition. So, um, but I do, you know, I support all of that. I think it's all, it's all good. You know, it's just, this is where I'm choosing to put my own particular energy. Um, nuclear abolition itself is a small step. Maybe it would help lay the groundwork for international cooperation to do the other things that we have to do together, like abolishing fossil fuel production or feeding the world or making good healthcare universally available or solving extreme income disparity or stopping pandemics or healing racism or ending injustices. You know, we're still evolving. You know, hopefully we still have time to keep evolving. Uh, we've made a thing that goes in our pocket that you can instantly connect with Mozart, with your mom, with all the scientific knowledge in the world, with Beyonce, with an endless number of wonderful cat videos. It's all in your pocket. You know, if we can do that, you know, we're pretty smart. And especially when we stop competing and we cooperate with each other. So what else might we achieve in the future? So we can do this if we really want to. 
it's been hard lately, um, but if we give up hope, the billionaires and the warmongers have already won, and we're not going to let them do that. You're quite right there. Um, so another question that I definitely hear, um, including from people in my own family who are very keen on, you know, environmental issues and reducing the carbon footprint and so on. Um, what about nuclear power? I mean, isn't there a role for nuclear power um, as part of the, the progress toward um, saving the environment? That's a great question. That's one I hear a lot too. Um, I'm not a fan of nuclear power. Um, I think it's a false solution to climate change. It's incredibly dangerous. And, you know, we've seen these disasters. We know, you know, what's about to get dumped into the Pacific Ocean from Fukushima. You know, it's, it's terrifying. Um, it's a false solution along with a lot of other ones that are being promoted, uh, like carbon trading and carbon capture and, and uh, all that other nonsense. So the, the treaty itself, the treaty on the corrupt nuclear weapons does not address nuclear power per se, um, because the authors are strategic and they're just really focused on the one issue. However, I am pretty sure that if we get rid of nuclear weapons, there will be no more reason to keep subsidizing the uh, unbelievably expensive nuclear power industry, because the nuclear power industry supplies, you know, it turns um, uranium into plutonium for the nuclear weapons. And if we didn't need to subsidize that, we probably would find better ways to uh, produce power. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, and could you tell me how the TPNW actually works? I mean, like if, if the United States were to join it or France or Britain or China or Russia or any of the others, but there are three NATO countries that have nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. If we can build the movement in these countries, um, what then happens? Well, it's, it's laid out in the treaty, which by the way, is really worth reading. And if you want a paper copy of it, uh, you can go to nuclearband.us. The, the link to find a paper copy is in the chat. Um, and also just to read it online if you want. It's, it's such a beautiful document. It's a pathway to nuclear disarmament, country by country, law by law, warhead by warhead, uh, where other treaties have failed. So if, for example, the US were to sign the treaty, um, it wouldn't get rid of nuclear weapons right away, but it would be an invitation to Russia, China, other nuclear weapon states to join us in committing again, since the uh, 50 plus year old nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty, um, to commit again to the complete elimination of these weapons. Um, and then there would be ample time to monitor the nuclear weapons countries' responses to that call and if necessary to negotiate the details of a disarmament process before anybody commits to anything. So the actual process would probably look like this. One country dismantles a certain number of weapons, waits for the other countries to do the same, and you just keep repeating that until all the weapons have been taken apart. All this has been already done successfully with other weapons and with nuclear weapons. At the end of the Cold War, lots of them were taken mm -hmm. apart. Um, and you know, people, ask, you know, well, what if somebody cheats? What if somebody keeps some hidden? And, you know, that's not really a very big risk because it's really hard to cheat. The, um, uh, the Inter International Atomic Energy um, Association, right? I agency, agency. Agency, thank you. Um, they keep track and they can monitor, you know, it's kind of hard to hide these things because they show up on seismographs, they show up on satellites, they show up in just the amount of money and infrastructure that's being poured into creating them. You know, they're not, they're not easy to hide in your sock. Um, so um, there will be permanent monitoring into the future to prevent uh, rebuilding the arsenals or, or to also to prevent any terrorists or um, other people from getting hold of the bomb. Um, and there are all kinds of verification measures built in for fair play. So, um, it's, it wouldn't really make us more vulnerable than we already are just having these things around. Good points, all of them. So um, I think that's probably all we have time for right now, unless anybody has a question, one more question just to pop in. Um, but you've been so uh, clear in what you've been saying, probably that's why nobody has any questions, but it's been great to have you with us, Vicki Elson. Um, it's really a pleasure to listen to you explaining this stuff and 
to see your your commitment and your dedication to doing it. So big thanks from you know all my board colleagues at uh, Just World Educational and me. We will be continuing this project, which is titled The Urgency of Banning Nukes. Throughout the rest of, of June, we're going to be having um, webinars twice a week on um, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern and as, as we are today on Saturday at noon Eastern. And we're talking with a number of people who are actually going to be at the Vienna meetings. So we will have either live or recorded updates from people who are in Vienna at the TPNW um, meeting of states parties, which I'm pretty excited about. We haven't quite nailed down yet what we're planning to do this Wednesday at 7 p.m., but I, I think it will be probably a combination of things. One is I would like everybody who's on this, who's seeing this webinar, um, whether live or recorded, to consider going back to watching the, um, the, the important 1983 documentary, The Day After. You can actually find this documentary. It's not a documentary, it, sorry. It's a dramatization of what would happen the day after a nuclear missile drops on Lawrence, Kansas. Um, so I'm, I've got the, uh, the link somewhere, but we, we'll send it to everybody anyway. It's a two hour dramatization that NBC produced in, I wanna say October of 1983. And it was really, influential at the time because it you know it, it starts off very cheesy you know an all-american family and you know the doctor and his wife and and the college students and other people and there is one guy that works in the in the nearby nuclear missile site and then and there's kind of heightened alert and you know it, then halfway through the movie everything changes because until now the 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 palette on the visuals has all been kind of, you know, waving corn and happy people in, in uh, university campuses and so on. And then a missile comes in and there's a massive nuclear blast. And the second half of this two hour movie actually um, presents it in fairly graphic and very depressing form what happens in terms of infrastructural breakdown, social and economic breakdown over the course of maybe two or three days so you know it's not just that the hospitals and and the the police and everything breaks down and oh gosh i i hesitate to even mention this in the current current circumstances but if you know how many weapons there are in the hands of individual americans right now it is a terrifying prospect that mm -hmm. something like this could be triggered i think if we could all try to look at that again before next Wednesday, having a discussion of whether this could actually be a useful tool for us in 2022 or some version of it. There is another version of it that is an animated nine minute mm -hmm. um, film. Amel, perhaps you could drop both those links into, into the chat so that people can see I personally think the kind of the pers intense personalization and the dramatization of the 1983 one, it, it grabs people more. The other one looks a bit like a, a video game, if you, if you like, um, disquietingly so. And I actually, if, if you want to really be scared, do a Google search for nuclear video game. And, and see how many actual video games there are out there that take this thing as just a game. So anyway, sorry that I went on quite a bit there. Want to um, urge you all to come back on Wednesday at 7 p.m. We will probably have a resource person from Europe speaking with us. We will hopefully have a, a discussion of the day after. And please go to our website, www justworldeducational.org. I hung it in a different place this time. I forgot where it was. Um, you will find a lot of information. There's a link on the homepage there that'll take you to the updated information about this project. You'll also find a donate button. So the donate button, very important. We don't get any funding from, oh, <laughs> 
military industrial complex companies, for example, we don't, unlike, you know, all the big think tanks around Washington, DC, which are funded either by, you know, the Saudis or the Qataris or by Boeing and Raytheon and whatever. Um, we don't get any of that funding. We're totally supported by grassroots donations. If you can help us, that would be great. I want to thank Amel Zaroug, who is in the background there, who's been doing great Zoom teching for us. And I hope she'll be back on the screen on Wednesday. Um, I always enjoy seeing her interactions with people. And Vicki Elson, thank you so much. It was great. It was a real pleasure to have you with us. All of you out there watching this, come back on Wednesday, come back next Saturday, and um, we'll take this project forward together. Thank you. And Bye. donate to Just World, don't forget. <laughs>